The More of Us podcast features real, uncut conversations about life, pastoral ministry, and walking with Jesus. All guests are pastors in the Caris Fellowship, bound by our common commitment to biblical truth, relationship, and mission. We trust as you hear more of us, you'll see Christ among us. Welcome to the More of Us podcast. This is Dr. Trent Lambert from Grace College and Seminary, and I'm joined today with Pastor Tim Sprinkle. Good to see you, Tim. Good to see you for our first podcast. First podcast. I've been talking to Julia, our administrative assistant in the office, and Christian. I am excited about this, Tim. We're going to have a lot of fun. I'm excited, too. I've been having uh, nightmares that nothing's going to work, but so far, so good. Well, we've just had a couple wrinkles this morning, but I think we're ready to go. And this morning, we have with us Dave Holmes. And Dave came on staff at Centerville Grace in March of 2007. He has a bachelor's degree in biblical studies from Grace College and a master of divinity from Grace Theological Seminary. He is married to his college sweetheart, and they have four sons. Pastor Dave loves golf, loves to play tennis, backpack, and he loves to read. Pastor Dave, welcome today. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. We're glad to have you. What your bio doesn't say, Dave, is that we were friends at Grace College many years ago, and I'm glad we still get to play. Yeah, go ahead. You were my RA, buddy. I My know, RA. I know, and I have horror stories from it. But you were, you've were you turned out well, Dave, and uh, we're glad— All because of you. Thank you. We're glad to have you here on the show and talking about life, ministry, and your walk with Jesus. You know, at the beginning, we wanted to ask you just some get-to-know-you quick-hit icebreaker questions. I may interact with your answers a little bit, but first of all, do you prefer salty or sweet things? Definitely sweet. Uh, people in my church know that I am a sucker for double stuffed Oreos. Do you eat the icing first? No, I dip it into a nice cold glass of milk. I let it get soft and then I eat the whole cookie at once. There is a way. You know, the other day, Dave, I was talking to the dean of our seminary, Freddie Cardoza, and he actually likes his Oreos just a little bit old where they're a little bit squishy. And then he's also not a dunker. So you're a dunker. I'm a dunker for sure. All right. Wow, we're talking about brother and roots here without even meaning to. That's kind of funny. Dave, what's a pet peeve of yours? Uh, I would say finding uh, foreign food particles in things like jelly and butter because someone didn't uh, take the time to clean off the utensil. I can't stand that. Okay. How? Well, you have four boys, so that probably— I got it's probably, four boys, so yeah. you know. We're not blame. We're not blaming anyone. How do you like your hamburgers? Uh, um, I love going to like Five Guys, although I don't love the prices anymore. But um, a bacon cheeseburger with extra bacon and extra cheese. And here's a little pro tip: they don't charge you for extra bacon or extra cheese. Uh, grilled onions, pickles, barbecue sauce makes it delicious. Now, Dave, are you just a single hamburger guy, or do you get multiple? If I can, I'll get multiple, but I got to watch my cholesterol these days. So I hear you, brother. I hear you. One of the joys of aging, right? What yes. is what was your favorite book that you read in 2022? Uh, I would say Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self was was up there for sure. Yep, that's a dense read. It's a good read, man. It I is. Maybe you or Jeremy Wyke or somebody recommended that and loved it. Yeah, good. Well, for those who are listening who don't want to read that thick version, you can find the more abbreviated version, uh, Strange New World by Carl Truman. That's a good one. Dave, what's a song that gets stuck in your head? Oh, man. Uh, I, I, oof, I, it probably depends on the morning. I'm usually singing a different song in the morning. Uh, my wife doesn't really like that all the time, but uh, I'm usually something, you see, singing something from the 90s usually I'm waking up to. Well, today, what was the song? Oh, Tim, you're putting me on the spot, man, for sure. Um, I don't know if I could tell you. I don't I don't remember this morning. Trent looks like he's ready to sing a song right now. <laughs> well, guys, you know, in, if my, I... in my contract at the church, I get paid not to sing here. So uh, that, that was yeah. kind of the contract with my church as well, that if I start singing right now, everyone in this podcast room is leaving. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. Now, I do have a question for you, Dave. Do you and your wife enjoy the same genre of music? You know, um, we we have definitely overlapping tastes, but definitely different tastes as well. So um, 
there are some things that she likes that I just do not. And but we've we found some commonalities along the way for sure. Yeah. You know, generally my my daughters and my son, I, I like, you know, more current stuff. But my wife, Tim, she loves like the fifties oldies. And so we'll wake up in the morning, she's playing fifties oldies, and I'm like, What are you doing? And so we have a wide genre of likabilities of music. We're we're very much the same, but I think everybody at our house likes the Beatles. Yeah, I I can understand that. Dave, what is something that you have said that you heard from your parents and swore you'd never say it? Mm-hmm. Uh, probably your your eyes are bigger than your belly. My my kids love to uh, take food and not eat it and not finish it. So I'd probably end up saying that. That's what my dad used to tell me all the time. My parents told me that at the Ryan's Family Steakhouse. I love those buffets, man. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. What's a good family tradition that you've developed? Um, well, we didn't actually develop this one. This was actually recommended by Dr. David Plaster. Uh, but every year uh, he recommended doing this when we got married. To get every year, order a personalized ornament that represented something significant of that year. And so each year you add on to that. And then uh, it has a way of becoming a, a place of storytelling as you hang up the ornaments each Christmas. So we do that. It's fun. I like that. Can you remember 2022 since it's the most recent? Um, I don't know if we've ordered that one yet. We, um, okay. my wife and I have to talk about that one. Yeah. Okay. Now, Dave, I have to ask you, how many Christmas trees do you put up? That's a great question. I, I personally put up zero. My wife puts up, uh, one, two, three. Oh, she's a I multiple. Trees. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I hear you. My wife usually does like seven to nine different trees and they're all decorated differently. And honest truth, Tim, this year, there were times, Pastor Dave, that we would have to shut off our furnace because the trees were actually heating the house. No joke. No wow. joke. That's when you know it's getting excessive. Yes. Yeah. That is a lot of trees. I don't know that we have enough rooms in our house for seven trees, but we have one in every bedroom, so we're definitely getting up there. Dave, what was the last date with your wife, Beth? Mm, uh, this is bad if I have to go look in my calendar. Um, I think it was back in October uh, for her birthday. I took her over to Columbus area and we had a couple nights just away with, you know, from the kids and just hanging out and it was cool. But it's been a while. So now I'm feeling like a bad husband. So she needs thanks, more. Tim. She needs more birthdays. Yes. Yes, she does. Yes, she does. And while you guys were away, did she have to call and check on the kids? Um, I think the kids end up calling her more now. Yeah. So true. So yeah. true. And we're going to we're going to transition from just questions about your life more to questions about your ministry. Sure. Dave, I I am just so excited to to journey through some of these questions. As a pastor and leader, I always am intrigued of how God works in the lives of others and how he develops them for ministry. And so I want to start with this question. If you could summarize your leadership journey and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, uh, just depends how far you want to go back. But, um, you know, I got I got started in the Grace Brethren Church, uh, Karis Fellowship Church now, uh, about third grade and grew up there at Worcester Grace and um, just saw some really fantastic um, pastors model ministry. Um, and so by the time I was in high school, I was on a actually a, on a missions trip to a Mississauga. We were helping, I think, the the first church to be planted in Canada. Grace, uh, Karis Fellowship Church, and on that trip, um, man, I just remember going, I would I would love to do something like this full time, and I kind of felt God's calling in my life um, at that point of just going into ministry, and uh, so from there, uh, ended up going to Grace College and Seminary, and after that, it was kind of a, a very random series of unfortunate events in the sense of um, I did not get uh, the job that I thought I was going to get after seminary um, had a job lined up, but it fell through. It's been about a year and a half kind of just in Warsaw, 
waiting and just wondering what God had in plan for me. Um, I actually was working at Warsaw Grace Church, helping out with young adults. Uh, they offered me a part-time job to with uh, with helping with young adults and life groups. And uh, Tom Abbott was the pastor there, and so I said yes to Tom. Um, during that same time, Centerville Grace. Uh, asked me if I was interested in coming down here. I said actually no to that job and then just didn't feel good after that decision. And so I kind of reversed my answers and told Tom, I said, I uh, felt like God's really leading me down to Centerville. And so um, I had to say no to him and, and he came here, um, came as the youth pastor for about a year and a half. At that point, the senior pastor resigned and I uh, didn't really know what to do after that. I thought maybe I would be needing to bow out as well because I wasn't sure if the church could afford two guys anymore. We weren't a very big church um, and it was an older church. And so uh, um, long story short, the, uh, the elders asked me to basically not give out my resume and decided to just listen to them and um, Eventually, we got connected with uh, a church plant um, that was struggling in 2009. Uh, they were going to close their doors, and they decided to um, see if they wanted to partner with us and kind of merge churches. And so at that church merger, uh, Sam Grice, who was one of our elders at the time, stood up and said, uh, this is only going to work if Dave becomes the, the lead pastor. And I, that was kind of a shock to me. And so they uh, voted me to be the lead pastor and help with this church merger. And they brought in a, some about 20, 20 somethings in the group. And uh, so we uh, just started kind of a, a fresh journey at Centerville Grace. And so from there, just trying to be obedient and just it's by God's grace that we have come this far. So. You know, I, I enjoyed hearing your story and how you got to where you are as a pastor. And I'm going to just jump rail here just a little bit and ask you a question. Now that you're in that role of a senior pastorship, how do you remain mentally healthy? How do, how do you unpack? How do you unwind? How do you make sure that you are, um, you know, in, in a place where you're, you're, again, mentally healthy, you're able to have great relationships, what do you knew in your position now um, to make sure that you are living a balanced life, engaged with family? What, what do you do? Yeah, that's a, that's been a uh, learning process for me. And um, I would say I would have probably answered differently th throughout these 15 years at Grace, but um you know, I, I kind of come down to maybe five different things that I make sure I, I have uh, or I'm doing. Um, one is I try to exercise most days. I try to get to the gym before I get to the office. Um, before that, quiet time um, and just obviously just time with God um, each morning, prayer, worship, biblical, just reflection, scripture, memory, things of that nature. Um, I found I need to have something on the calendar to look forward to, um, and I have a hopeful piece um, in there. Uh, I need to be uh, pausing and, and looking back and being thankful and just taking time to do that as well. Um, so there's different things that, that I need to do um, to just kind of make sure I am thankful, I'm hopeful, um, making sure my joy cup is, is filled in those ways. Dave, as you were talking, I heard a book title, and the book title would be Have Something on the Calendar. There's a lot to be yeah. said, Tim, about having a hopeful place. Absolutely. I, I, As you were describing those things, I was thinking somewhat of a rule of life, too, which is a phrase that's in vogue these days, but that approaching your spiritual life holistically, so it's not simply the ministry that you do or a couple of habits here and there, but we have healthy relationships, we have healthy rhythms with our time and our calendar and our family. We take care of our body, and of course we commune with God through all these things, but I really liked what you said about the timing element because it gives you something to look forward to, but also something to look back on and be grateful. Gratitude is one of the greatest practices in the Christian life. Amen, Tim. Um, I, I want to segue kind of to go forward with what we just discussed. And you mentioned a little bit of this in your narrative, 
But could you just unpack a little bit of some key influences and some people in your life that's helped develop you as a pastor? For sure. So, of course, you know, mentioning Worcester Grace, a lot of a lot of great pastors there, a lot of great volunteers there. Um, a lot of guys poured into my life. Uh, so, you know, Bob Federhoff certainly comes to mind. His um, just longevity at that church, one, his consistency and integrity and, and things of that nature throughout um, 30, 40 plus years there has been awesome. Um, Clancy Cruz was another pastor there for a long time. Um, and through my kind of like junior high, high school years was very impressionable. Uh, let, you know, great. Made a, made a great impression on me. Um, my best friend, Jeremy, uh, him and I met um, a long time, even before Worcester Grace, like maybe when we were three or four years old, and then we reconnected third grade, Mrs. Armstrong's class in the, in, at that church, and he's been my best friend ever since. And so he's also a pastor and also um, just, uh, you know, kind of the same stages of life with me. And so it's been, it's been neat to be able to go through life with him and, and deal with a lot of the same things. Uh, Dan Gregory was uh, my pastor during basically the college years at Grace College, and he's been a great friend and mentor. Uh, Dr. David Plaster was, uh, like so many other guys can say, was a guy who I could always go into his office and uh, get some wisdom. He was he was basically, you know, my Yoda, like so many other people's Yodas. And then uh, when I got to Centerville Grace, uh, Ned Denlinger, who uh, is on staff with me, uh, who's older than I am. He's a father figure type person in my life and has always been there and helping me out. So those guys, for sure. This is a perfect illustration of why we're doing the More of Us podcast, by the way. The names of these people that you mentioned for any of our listeners who are likely Karis pastors, Karis leaders, Karis church members, they hear a name like Dave Plaster or Clancy Cruz or Bob Federhoff. And they're like, oh, yeah. I mean, as, even as you were talking, I was like, you know, Dan Gregory was my pastor in college. And he actually, when he was in college and seminary at Grace, or seminary at least, he and his wife did a kids ministry at Leesburg Grace, where I'm currently pastor. And I occasionally see him at conferences and Momentum Pro. And I just love the connections that we have in our fellowship of churches. So you've illustrated really well why we're doing this podcast. Yeah, I've been I've been really blessed by so many different men in our in our network of churches and pastors. It's been it's been amazing. You know, there's a confidence that when we have those people in our lives, we can pick up the phone call and have a conversation with them. And you know what? We we can proverbially let our hair down, we can talk with them, we can share, and just knowing that they don't need anything from us other than relationship. Yep. Yep. You know, um, Dave, I work here at Grace College and Seminary. I'm the director for the Center for Thriving Leaders for the Caris Fellowship. Also um, teach quite a few courses and oversee a master's program here. So I'm coming from the pastoral side, but also the academic side. And, you know, we've all had this narrative where when we graduate from seminary, we have this question, why didn't they teach me that? And so could you tell us something that you may not have learned in seminary and had to learn it the hard way? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I really appreciated my time at, at Grace College and Grace Seminary. Uh, let me start off by saying that. But yeah, they can't teach you everything. And of course, there's so much uh, you learn after seminary. But one of the things for me was really around leadership and managing staff. Um, I've kind of had to learn that the hard way throughout the years and um, trying to just glean from others. But yeah, that's definitely something that I wish we had more of, but I understand you can't, you can't teach everything in, in a three-year time. So, Tim, how about you as a pastor? What's something that seminary may have not prepared you as well for? I just think of, uh, we're talking about meetings. I didn't know how to lead a meeting. My first meeting I went to, I was sort of paralyzed. I was like, I wish I were a fly on the wall. That's how I feel right now. I'm 15 years into it at Leesburg, almost 16. I feel like this year, at the end of last year, into this year, I finally figured out a few things about how to make meetings meaningful for people in our congregation because I often felt like we were just spinning wheels or wasting time. And now there's vision as part of meetings and collaboration. And sometimes we end early, which everyone cheers and celebrates when that happens. You know, I think for me, one of the hardest things was um, when you get that dreaded phone call, that phone call of, Pastor, the Lord has led me on. 
And how do we deal that with as a pastor when someone leaves our church and not taking it personal and then, you know, seeing that person in the community and still having a love relationship in Christ for them? So early on for me, that was difficult. No one really prepared what my emotions would be like, almost feeling like a family member left. That was difficult for me. Yeah, and the longer you're in a single place, the more you have those people who come and go, but you're still in the same larger community and you see them. So that's for sure a difficult thing to deal with. Yeah. And Tim, you have to get to the point where you're not, when you go to Walmart and you see them, you can go to down to the same aisle and shake their hand and generally have a good conversation with them. So, oh, there's someone and then try to get to the next style, right? Yeah. That reminds me of something I heard from another Karis pastor, Jordan Gillette. He's a youth pastor and he grew up as a pastor's kid in the Karis Fellowship. And he said that their family couldn't go to Walmart without his dad doing Walmart uh, shepherding or Walmart pastoring or grocery store pastoring. And uh, that's the next question for you, Dave, is related to that. I mean, a pastor's job description is pretty vast. And what would you say is something that maybe is underappreciated about pastoral ministry? And that could be something that the world underappreciates, maybe people in your church, or answer it how you'd like. Yeah, I was, was going to say just just how many different hats a pastor ends up having to wear, especially if they're at a maybe smaller church uh, with not a lot of staff and not a lot of help. They end up doing so many different things. And um, it's just when I got here, it was amazing of like all the things I didn't know and had to learn. And um, but I think there's a little bit of an expectation that pastors come out of seminary and they know how to do everything in the church and they have all the answers and they know exactly how to talk about the cultural issues and things of that nature. So just all the different hats from graphic design work, uh, learning how to do video, internet, you know, website stuff, um, to counseling, to just whatever. It's just seems like there's, which I love, this is part of the job I actually love because you get to do so many different disciplines, but um, it's, it's a lot. That's actually one of the things I love about pastoral ministry at a smaller church. I get to try so many different things. Maybe I'm not a master of anything, but I definitely get to be curious and tinker and grow in a lot of areas. And by definition, a disciple is a learner. It's someone who wants to learn under Jesus and figure out how Jesus intersects with everyday life. And I know that's a big passion of yours as a disciple making disciple, um, a disciple. Well, you phrase it your way. Tell me a little bit about your journey with discipleship and the navigators. Yeah. Um, so about seven years ago, um, one of the navigators church ministry, um, I don't know I mean, call them missionaries or just on staff there. They the guy's named Justin Gravitt, um, who is the kind of the local navigator here, uh, came into our church and uh, introduced himself and um, offered to help us as a, as a church. And I didn't know what a navigator was. I didn't know what navigators ministries uh, didn't know their history, didn't know anything about them. And so uh, he offered, though, the idea of one-on-one -on -one disciple making and creating a culture of one-on-one -on -one disciple making in our in our church, and um, really just kind of fell in love with that idea because we had, after the church merger, we had a lot of uh, things to to change and to turn around this this older, um, more dying church, and so we changed the you know uh, Sunday morning experience. We switched to life groups, small groups, instead of just Sunday school classes on Sunday. Um, but that piece of one-on-one -on -one disciple making and really helping someone develop and grow in Christ uh, was something that I thought was really needed. So I said yes to partnering with him, and we started meeting um, just individually, him and I. He also would meet with our staff and began to develop a heart for disciple making. We began to develop some skills I started discipling, and then he introduced me to the idea of creating a core team in our church where we get others to understand and develop a heart, vision, and skill for disciple making. And so once that core team uh, got equipped and developed that kind of heart and vision, we sent them out into our church, and they began to disciple. And so that's where um, we are currently. We're just uh, creating a culture of disciple makers here now. That's great. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned in there was the the vision piece. What? Uh, how would you how would you define discipleship in simple terms? 
Well, yeah, we use the language disciple making because I think it um, encourages more of the the mission vision piece of it of multiplication. It's not just uh, me learning to be like Jesus, although that's a huge part of it, but but also being like Jesus means we go out on mission like Jesus did and, and um, evangelize and, and uh, help make disciples. So, um, yeah, so we use the phrase disciple making and helping people understand that as their identity as a disciple, one of the key features of a disciple is someone who actually goes and makes other disciples of Jesus. So we, we really encourage that kind of um, focus of out going out and that's the next step of our of our whole church journey of now that we have plenty of people in the church learning and, and doing disciple making it's time to go out and begin reaching people to, to bring them back in to, to disciple good well, we want to um, transition to just your walk with Jesus here at the end as you're making a disciple making culture at your church that requires you to walk closely with him. You've already mentioned five things that you do and uh, we want to respect the idea of looking at time, practicing gratitude, memorizing scripture. But I was wondering if there was a spiritual rhythm that you are trying to develop or tinkering with right now to develop intimacy or dependency on Jesus that you could tell us about. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to think of something beyond like just the daily disciplines, but I think when it comes to uh, doing the work of disciple making and walking with people and doing the work of evangelism and um, trying to uh, you know reach my neighborhood and reading the Bible with my neighbors, all that um, all that idea is is always forcing me. Uh, in a good way to to go back to Jesus, knowing that uh, I can't do these things without him. And uh, he's the one doing the work uh, ultimately. Uh, but I, as as I partner with him, I am I am encouraged and forced at times just to go, God, I, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but I need more of you. And so depending on him, walking with him as he's on mission and he invites us to be on mission with him uh, just helps me stay close to Jesus. Yeah, I like that simple prayer. I I need you. I need you, God. Mm. What about a spiritual habit or rhythm that you would like to develop? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I've been developing more of a habit of fasting these last few years and um, going, you know, trying to increase how many days I, I do fast. And fasting and prayer usually are and are supposed to go together. And so it's interesting, even though I'm going longer periods of fasting, I find it harder to to pray longer periods of time. So uh, I would say one thing that I'm trying to develop more is just longer periods of quiet um, prayer and reflection and meditation and things of that nature. Trent, has fasting and prayer been a big part of your ministry? Over the years of, of pastoring, yes. Um, you know, you, you would do you know, momentarily fasting or a day fast or a three-day fast. And then, you know, a popular thing is, you know, the, the Daniel's fast at the beginning of the year. So we did various pieces of those. And there was a few years in the early part of our ministry um, that I would do 40-day fasts. And I would take a little bit of, of nutrition, like a nutrition powder and some water. But I would I would go on 40-day fast just like that. And um, I think one year I lost like 40 pounds. And so um, it got to the point when I would do that, though, it was difficult to preach when you got close to the end of it. But, you know, we saw God do some incredible things and um, just saw a closeness with God. And, um, you know, I, I got to say, you know, the busier we get, it gets more difficult, you know, to keep your, you know, your strength and so on and so forth. But I think prayer and fasting, as Scripture tells us, is vitally important, especially in the pastoral ministry. Yeah, Jesus even assumes it in the Sermon on the Mount when you're fasting. And I think it's an underappreciated spiritual practice in the States. And a lot of times we'll conflate giving up something like social media with fasting. And I've more recently heard a lot of pushback against that. Fasting is related to food. Other things are called abstinence. And so that practice really teaches dependency. Jesus provides the food that we need for everyday life. So you've mentioned dependency. What's something you feel like you need to hear from from Jesus right now, Dave? Mm. 
Uh, you know, neat is, is a strong word, uh, but I, I'm a, a one on the Enneagram. And so I often battle the self critic in my head. And so I would say something along the lines of Jesus saying, I'm proud of you, or you're doing a really good job. Um, things that just silence that self critic would be great to hear. Yeah. I think that's probably true for a lot of pastoral leaders or public figures is you just constantly pushing forward, but questioning, you know, am I, am I doing the right thing, saying the right thing? Am I enough is really maybe the question that comes up. And the fact, the fact that we chose you Dave here at the beginning of our podcast series was because I think you're doing a good job. I absolutely appreciate your friendship, your faithfulness, your vision for a disciple-making culture in your church, your commitment to family, the fellowship, the Word of God. So if I can be the voice of Jesus here for these last uh, 10 seconds, you're doing well, man. You really are. Uh, Thanks, Tim. Thanks for your friendship. Yeah. Hey, Dave. In our last few moments here together, we've got a lot of Karis leaders and pastors listening what one thing would you want to leave them with today and encourage them as a leader and pastor in ministry? Uh, this has been a, a tough, tough season after COVID, you know, during COVID and, and coming out of COVID. And uh, I just really just encourage all of our, our pastors and our fellowship to stay connected to each other and to encourage one another. And I, I couldn't have gone this far in ministry without the network of, of these men that I mentioned, um, supporting me, encouraging me, praying for me, giving me advice, making sure I'm not doing something really stupid and idiotic. And um, so I just just encourage all of our, our pastors to to really get connected if they're not connected and to stay connected. Do do the hard work of staying connected. Go to the, you know, the focus retreats, uh, you know, national conference, uh, anything that can get you connected, the cohorts, whatever it is. They get get connected and stay connected, I would encourage. Dave, I want to thank you so much for joining the More of Us podcast today. What you have shared today I know is going to help a lot of people, a lot of pastors. And it could just be one thought, could just be one word that could just really help a pastor today in a mighty way. Tim, any last thoughts? Nope, this has been fun. I enjoy to connect I enjoy connecting with you, Dave, whenever I get a chance. All right. We're going to have many more podcasts. We're going to be reaching out to a lot of people in the Karis Fellowship, bringing encouraging words, some insights, and hopefully a lot of fun. This is Dr. Trent Lambert from the Center for Thriving Leaders in Grace Theological Seminary, along with Pastor Tim Sprinkle of Leesburg Grace Church, bringing the More of Us podcast to the Karis Fellowship.